I'm the chair of the Yoga Society of Suni Uniyanta. My name is Ashok Mohotra. I'm also in the Department of Philosophy at Suni Uniyanta. Today we have uh, a wonderful guest, uh, Dr. Christopher Chappell, who is uh, the chair of theological studies as well as uh, the associate vice president at Loyola Marymount University. I'm very happy that you are here and we'll be talking about uh, your experiences with yoga and Christian meditation. We have also Dr. Schrader here, Chairman of the Philosophy Department and also Distinguished Teaching Professor at SUNY Uniyanta. And we'll be asking some questions and we are going to have some fun together. Now today's topic uh, on which you will be uh, giving a lecture and that's uh, contemplative practice mm -hmm. in Christianity and yoga. Now, what's important for us is that when we started this society, uh, our goal was to show that uh, yoga and meditation could become a model mm -hmm. for a dialogue between science and religion. And your experience of teaching yoga, participating in yoga, writing lots of book, books, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Uh, where can this dialogue start? Mm -hmm. And how have you started it? Mm -hmm. Well, the starting point, I think, will be the topic that you've introduced of science, that the brain investigators, the neurotheologians, as they're now being called, are determining that when people meditate, when people go into states of contemplation and prayer, regardless of the tradition, there's an activation of the frontal lobes of the brain. And this is given for those who need it, a materialist proof that, in fact, something happens when people meditate. People change when they meditate. Right. And not thinking that we need to rely on that data in order to affirm the validity of this practice, I think it's nonetheless very helpful to have the confirmation that when people, after periods of meditation and prayer, claim that they feel more calm, we know, we can measure that in fact the result is that they go into a place of equipoise, they go into a place where they're less agitated. And then for me, as a scholar of the history of religions and as someone who's had a number of years of experience with both teaching about and learning and teaching directly the methods of meditation in various traditions, then what's interesting to me is that we can't just look at a brain scan and then make our brain light up in those places. Right. We have to go right. through the techniques, we have to go through the practices and the approaches that are used in order for people to gain the benefits of meditation. Uh -huh. Now, we find that in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, the practitioners of yoga and other contemplative kind of disciplines is on the increase. Right. Uh, during the past uh, of uh, five years, mm -hmm. uh, we have moved from 10 million to almost 50 million people practicing right. yoga or some form of mm -hmm. meditation. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's the case? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a very interesting historical reason, partly, and also there's been a shift in our culture and our civilization. Historically, we have now coming of age people that have grown up in these traditions that are now in a position where they can share what they've learned from a place of responsibility and ownership so that there are more people qualified to train other people in order how to, to do this. And then the other more cultural shift, why are so many more people interested, is the, on the one hand, we might call it a fracturing of a common culture, but on the other hand, I think we can look at it as a diversity of opportunities becoming available, as well as people feeling the need to reconnect with their bodies and reconnect with their spiritual nature. With mass culture, there's very little, it's usually about how beautiful everybody else is, right. <laughs> but there's very little available in the culture that allows us to also feel that inner beauty, which then can manifest in uh, a comfort level with oneself and with being with other people. And yoga and meditation provide that inner strength 
that then makes it easier for people to be with themselves and to be with the world. Okay. Now, from your point of view, since you have been a practitioner of yoga, mm -hmm. a scholar of yoga, mm -hmm. meditation, and also you have taught uh, Christian beliefs, mm -hmm. and also you have studied mm -hmm. people who follow Christian beliefs, right. uh, from your point of view, uh, how will you actually uh, describe mm -hmm. what this meditative practice is in okay. yoga mm -hmm. and also in Christianity? Okay. To begin with, with yoga, the definition is chitta vritti nirodha, that the process of yoga is designed to take all of the flutterings and the habituations of the mind and to bring them to a point of stillness. And the word nirodha was used by the Buddha and it refers to that moment where your desires and your agitations are in a place of being settled down. Okay. And yoga practice, which involves movement, it involves breathing, it involves ethical reflection and practice, as well as focusing of the mind, yoga brings one to a place where there's that moment of release. And even if it's just for a few minutes, say at the end right. of a yoga movement class, still you feel as you're lying there on the floor, literally the cares of the world depart, you know, they're lifted away from you. And then renewed and reinvigorated, you're able to go back okay. and engage, but n with less anxiety. Okay. So before you talk about the Christian system right. of meditation, so what you're really saying is that yoga is much more complex a system than just doing a few physical exercises. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned that there are right. breathing exercises, meditation exercises, right. there are ethical disciplines, right. a certain kind of attitude of the mind, what kind of foods you eat, what kind of drinks go in. Right. So it's a holistic system. It, it's not just uh, uh, 10, 15 physical exercises you can stand on your head that's right. or you sit like a pretzel. Right. And it's not just that. So right. it's much more than it's a lifestyle. Exactly. Yeah. One of the, I think, entry points for particularly Americans to gain a deeper understanding of yoga is to reflect on the life and the work of Mahatma Gandhi. And the two disciplines, three really, that he brought forward into the public consciousness were ahimsa, which is nonviolence, right. satyagraha, which is holding to truth, and aparigraha, which is non-possession, not accumulating too much stuff. Mm -hmm. And in our training, my wife and I trained for 12 years in a classical ashram, and in our training each week we were assigned one of these disciplines, and during right. the times when we were doing ahimsa or nonviolence, we had to make certain that our food was not of a nature where animals had been harmed, we also were especially vigilant that we were not going to step on worms on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And it was given for a week, and we would come back to class and talk about all the different right. imaginative ways we engage nonviolence. Similarly with truth, you know, how is truth to be practiced? How can one practice truth fully and still be nonviolent? Mm -hmm. With non-possession in American culture, this is perhaps our greatest challenge, where it's so easy to accumulate a lot of stuff. I remember right. one of the teachings that we came upon was that we don't own things, things end up owning us. Right. That the right. more expensive a car you have, yes. the more upset you're going to get if it gets scratched. Mm -hmm. But the larger the house you have, right. the larger amount of taxes you need to pay. Mm -hmm. That to be able to live with a minimal amount of comfort will bring a greater satisfaction than the responsibility of, of accumulating yeah. lots of things. So how about now the saying something about Christian contemplative practice? Okay. Yes. I'd like to talk about two traditions, one from the Protestant sector and the other from the Roman Catholic sector. Yeah. And the first that I'll talk about is perhaps one of the more recent Christian movements dating from the 1600s, but it's the Religious Society of Friends or the Quakers. Uh -huh. And George Fox lived in England, and yeah. he lived at a time when there was great debate over Catholic versus Protestant. Right. There was a great debate about you know, state-instituted religion or should there be something of more owned by the people than being mandated by the government, what should the relationship with Rome be, etc. Lots, lots of issues. Mm -hmm. And he visited 
from church to church, and he decided that the best way to be a Christian was to sit in open receptivity, in silence, and developed a, te a technique, a method, which he yeah. calls meeting for worship. Yeah. And as his friends, as he came to call them, sat with one another for an hour in silent contemplation, they would receive messages from, as they would put it, from the inner light. And then from that experience of the inner light, they would come upon information to share. They would come upon resolves about what they were to do next. And they began to craft for themselves not only a religious practice grounded in contemplation, but of great importance for George Fox and the Friends is that they came to a place of seeing that nonviolence was the primary core teaching of Jesus. And they advocated yeah. that no members of their organization would ever engage in military service. Uh -huh. And they eventually instituted the foundation for what is now modern feminism. And they also instituted the techniques for lobbying governmental agencies mm -hmm. for the causes of social welfare yeah. and also for backing away and finding diplomatic approaches to resolving conflict mm -hmm. rather than going into war. Yeah. I think Dr. Scheer might have a question yeah. for you. Um, yeah, yeah. If, if we could come back to, um, to the, the notion of uh, neurotheology. Uh, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's uh, striking, as Dr. Malhotra has indicated, has been the, um, the rapid rise of interest by the American populace mm -hmm. in things like yoga, uh, other um, meditative traditions that uh, are certainly different from mm -hmm. what most Americans have grown up with in terms of either their Christian or Jewish heritage. Right. Um, are there studies that would suggest that perhaps some of these Asian traditions um, more readily produce results uh, that could be measured in terms of the brain activity you've noted? Um, is there a conflict that is produced? for people who are raised within one sort of religious tradition mm -hmm. and then try to uh, engage in the practices of others? And if so, are those conflicts that we can similarly map out in the brain? Okay. In all of the religious traditions that I've studied, there is an element. An element can be found of contemplation. Generally, what has happened, both in India and in the Christian world and in the Jewish world, is that it would be very specialized practitioners that would take up these techniques. Right. In traditional Christianity, it would be monks and nuns, cloistered nuns. It would be monks sequestered away in monasteries. In the Jewish tradition, Kabbalah right. would be not even accessible as a knowledge system until a person was 40 years old. And these texts, even within the Buddhist tradition, were considered to be esoteric. There were mm -hmm. only certain people qualified to learn about them. And it was not until really the 1960s that the texts of Roman Catholic mystical practice became accessible. Right. So I think that what we're finding here is a, a laicization process. Mm -hmm. If you talk to a mainstream Hindu in right. India or to a lay Buddhist in Thailand, they will not necessarily be aware of the techniques used by the religious mm -hmm. renouncers, okay. the techniques used mm -hmm. by the monks. So just as in the area, era of Protestantism and the, the reformation of the Catholic Church, right. after the time of Martin Luther, where you saw the Bible being delivered wholesale and education being advocated right. for all believers, so now we have access to information as well as techniques that had been bottled up for a very, very long time. Okay. Okay. And we need it now more than ever. This is, I think, a wonderful development, and I think that it really accounts for the responsivity of the people wanting to get a little piece of this right. peace of mind that the religious right. practitioners have had for many, many, many years. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, in uh, Quakerism, uh, the idea of uh, contemplation is connected to the idea of silence. Yes. Now, in Hinduism, uh, I don't know about yoga. There was a part of yoga 
which was devoted to being silent. Right. And that's why a lot of these people who are practicing yoga moved away from the commotion of the society mm -hmm. into the caves. But even if you're not a yogi in India, if you're just a swami, mm -hmm. a person who uh, practices some of the tenets of Hinduism, they will do something very similar to mm -hmm. what Fox did. And they will spend maybe three weeks to a month mm -hmm. when they will detach themselves, disconnect themselves from right. the community, from right. their friends. They'll go away to the woods mm -hmm. and sit there mm -hmm. and not be connected to anybody. Right. It's like total disconnection mm -hmm. with the society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you explain that in terms of our kind of society, mm -hmm. that it's emphasized in India, it's emphasized also uh, among the Quakers mm -hmm. to disconnect and be mm -hmm. silent. Mm -hmm. Here we are so dependent on our telephones, mm -hmm. on cell phones, that we are so connected and we find that it's very hard to get away. Mm -hmm. So how do you change that lifestyle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to some other tell the young people for our society, where even walking around, talking in the dark, and right. sometimes you wonder yeah. what is so important that to keep talking. How do you introduce that kind of mm -hmm. silence? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Even well, though there yeah. is a uh, you know, great deal of uh, practice going on, yoga exercises, mm -hmm. but the silence part, I don't think people are adopting. Well, it's very interesting because in India, of course, the term for that is mauna, and someone who practices mauna is a muni, which is a sage. And I would disagree a little bit with your assessment that we don't do this because increasingly what I'm finding, not just in California where I live, but in other parts of the United States, is that people are seeking out silent retreats. And there are retreat centers all over the country now, some Buddhist, some Christian, that have really long waiting lists of people that want to go away for a weekend or a week or even perhaps as long as three weeks, where they will take on a vow of silence. Now in our yoga training, uh, which we participated in during our late teen years and through our 20s, right. we had a discipline of keeping silent one day a week. And during that one day a week, we said nothing. We, if we had to communicate, we would write it down and pass a note along. And we came up with some interesting strategies if you had to be out getting your car fixed. But we just, you know, sort of smiled and made our way through it. And it was a way of taking that break. And mm -hmm. then the next day when you would start talking again, you would hear how important your words are. And I think the trivialization of words is something that we suffer from. And we know mm -hmm. as a culture that we have to get away from it sometime. And again, the prevalence now of retreats and even at our university we offer silent retreats both for our students and for our faculty again waiting lists people want to be able to slow down and become mm -hmm. quiet and uh, do you think that uh, uh, there are other kinds of contemplative practices in christianity yes in the side silence oh absolutely yeah. Uh, there's um, a wonderful innovator called Jim Finley, who is a teacher and author in, uh, within the Catholic tradition yeah. based in California. And he had been a student of Thomas Merton. Okay. And Thomas okay. Merton was a very famous Trappist monk who wrote his autobiography about his yeah. you know, potential writing career yeah. out of Columbia University, went through a great deal of different sorts of experiences, decided to take up the spiritual life and live for many years in Gethsemane. Yeah. and learned about Buddhist meditation and right. began to bring that back into his monastic complex. Mm -hmm. And with the sort of integration that he produced and the training that he gave to his followers, mm -hmm. there now have come about very popular movements within the Roman Catholic community of Christian meditation. One of the ways that they use is first reading, and mm -hmm. usually it will be something from scripture, although sometimes it may be poetry. Mm -hmm. And then they think about it discursively. And I recently attended one of their sessions and it begins with the leader, in this case Jim okay. Finley, reading a passage from the Bible. And this passage was about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Jesus uh -huh. comes, asks right. of her to have a drink of water. Mm -hmm. 
And then he talks to her about her life. It's a very famous story. Most people in the Christian tradition are familiar with it. Yep. And he talked about that story, talked about the need to humble yourself to request help from time mm -hmm. to time. That was the spin that he put on it. And then we sat in silence. We sat in silence for a half hour. Mm -hmm. And then we stood up and we walked for 10 minutes in silence. And then we sat back again. And then there was discussion. Okay. And in this exercise, which began with reading, which then was discursive thinking about it, mm -hmm. then a protracted meditational period. And for some people, there was a moment of revelation. For some people, there was what in the Christian tradition we call an epiphany. Yeah. And it renewed them. It gave them hmm. something that they could then listen to throughout the week, that is, listen to, I mean, remember, think about that passage, okay. think about the significance of an outcast woman okay. coming into communication with someone who was elevated, right. and then that becomes a paradigm for how to be a mm -hmm. spiritual person in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. So this was an interesting combination because part of the technique is Buddhist and yogic, right. part of it is uh, reading scripture, which is certainly is Christian. It also Kabbalah too, because in Kabbalah you do that too. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Dr. Schroeder has well, a question. There are two different things that you, you've talked about in terms of, of contemplation, and, and perhaps that's simply an indication of how complex it can be. Mm. Um, one is creating that, um, that vacant space, that silence. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is actively thinking about something. Right. whether it is the woman at the well or ahimsa or, right. or mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would, could you speak a little more between about that dynamic between conscious thought on the one hand mm -hmm. and absence mm -hmm. of conscious thought mm -hmm. on the other? Right. Well, the beginning of the meditative quest is acknowledging that our mind behaves like a monkey. I mean, our mind right. will go everywhere and anywhere mm -hmm. And the beginning point is to accept that, is to say, my mind can go to Jupiter and Venus. My mind can go you know, to the depths of the geothermal level. You know, we have so right. much information. Yeah. Our culture bombasts us, or really bombards us, with a whole range of different images, right. many of which aren't all that wholesome. Mm -hmm. So the meditation process is to, first of all, acknowledge the power of the mind, and then give it something fun to do, you know, give it something constructive. And this is the beginning of what in the Buddhist tradition is called bhavana, or the self-creation of a world mm -hmm. that you would like to inhabit. Yep. Right. And that to me is really the gift of scripture, is that right. it lays out a paradigm for where yeah. we can be heading and the gift of repeated practice and of community practice, and that we are able to come to a point of saying, you know, these are the people that I want to be with, and these are the right. thoughts I want to work with. So one of the, um, uh, the common observations with respect mm -hmm. to, to Christian prayer, which I, I would regard uh, as part of that contemplative tradition, is that uh, that is a dialogue that requires both conversing with and listening to mm -hmm. the divine voice and that, uh, that a lot of times Christians fail on the second side of it. Mm -hmm. They fail to, to have the silent prayer in which they're receptive. Mm -hmm. um, would that pretty well coincide with your observations? I think so. And I think that in some of the Christian church services that I now attend, more and more they're allowing at least a few moments for whatever's been said or whatever's been read to sink in. And that moment of receptivity that comes in quiet, we all need to make more space for, right. more time for. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that could be actually the connection there mm -hmm. between uh, yogic meditation mm -hmm. and Christian uh, practice of silence. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in yogic meditation, actually you're going through that silence, mm -hmm. you're stilling. Mm -hmm. All the fluctuations, like you said, yog, chit, vritti, naroda. Mm -hmm. The yoga is the stoppage of all those mental changes, all right. those. What we will call in America as 
all those stresses and strains right. on our body, on our emotions, on mm -hmm. our mind, mm -hmm. they have to be brought to a stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have to be silenced. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking that the goal of yoga is that absolute silence of right. all these changes. Right. So in Christianity, we're doing almost that, mm -hmm. recognizing the comfort, the contentment, the joy mm -hmm. that silence brings. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of uh, joy which meditation mm -hmm. and yoga will finally bring. So I think maybe that's where the connection is. Right. So what do you think about that part? Yeah. I think that's a very valid observation. I also think that singing is increasingly recognized yeah. as a spiritual practice. And there are people that make their living just putting out on, on email and on the internet that yeah. I'm going to yeah. be leading a chanting session. Right. And they go all around the country, Jai Uttal, Krishna yeah. Das. Uh -huh. um, a whole range of people that right. have discovered that old Protestant standby, which is, if all else fails, start singing. Start singing. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, actually, uh, singing is part of yoga also. Mm -hmm. Because you know that in yoga, one of the things which is emphasized, mm -hmm. that is, uh, you start where you are. Mm, right. And you cannot immediately go into meditation unless you change a kind of lifestyle right. where you eat certain kinds of foods and drink certain mm -hmm. kinds of things and then have certain kinds of attitudes. Right. But also, uh, since we are talkative beings, mm -hmm. we, that's the way we socialize. Mm -hmm. So you start with japa. Mm -hmm. Japa is one of the things which is mentioned, a community kind of chanting together, right. singing together. Mm -hmm. And that will bring the kind of unity. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that will ultimately lead you in the direction of recognizing that uh, if you can create this kind of uh, community feelings, mm -hmm. togetherness, you can have a kind of uh, control of all this community stuff going on in your mind, all these agitations. Mm -hmm. You can all bring them together through japa, bring them, change them into a mass of energy, right. and finally mm -hmm. make it disappear. Exactly. And I think japa, with a certain sound, certain like Om mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, Soham mm -hmm. can lead you in that direction. So mm -hmm. Japa becomes, mm -hmm. or chanting, becomes uh, a way to that concentration. Exactly. And this is a long-standing yeah. Christian tradition as well, yeah. with people saying the Lord's Prayer, people gathering to say right. the Rosary, and so on. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's wonderful, really, uh, that uh, uh, ultimately, people are coming together mm. and finding out that uh, most of the time our life is pulled and pushed by outside forces mm -hmm. and we have no time for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think whether it's Christian meditation or Jewish meditation, Islamic meditation or Hindu or Buddhist or mm -hmm. Taoist, mm -hmm. all of them are saying, sit, spend some time on yourself, mm -hmm. find out who you really are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So meditation, contempl contemplative practice, they're really telling us that you are very important. Mm -hmm. You are here on this earth to find out who you really are mm -hmm. and get in touch with your inner self. Contentment, happiness, joy all resides inside you. Mm -hmm. And that's what the goal of contemplation is. That's what the goal of yogic meditation is or any kind of reflection is. Sit down, Absolutely. take charge of yourself. And I think that's what it comes down to. And I'm thinking that we're very happy that you are able to be with us and I thank uh, Metanexis Institute as well as Suni Onianta to fund our project. And thank you for coming yeah. here. Thank you, Ashok. And joining us. And thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Ashok.